Our next speaker is Peg Birmingham. She's a professor of philosophy at DePaul University. Uh, she's written a number of books, co-edited more. Um, she has a new book which will be coming out, I hope, next year, maybe late next year or early the year after, Hannah Arendt and Political Glory, Bearing the Unbearable. Um, Peg never shies away from the hard in Arendt, which is one of the reasons I've always loved her work. Um, the book that uh, many of you may know, uh, one that I teach every year and uh, is one of those books that I constantly love to go back to, is Hannah Arendt and Human Rights, um, a book that really was the first time someone took those, chap those part remarks about the right to have rights and that the only truly human right is to speak and act in public and Hannah Arendt's discussion of human rights in chapter nine of The Origins and push it forward into the human condition and ask and, 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 and make the, I think, clearly right claim that um, human condition is an attempt to understand what is the human that human rights might protect if it's not just the right to life and the other things that human rights uh, are typically thought to mean. And uh, it's in a deeply important book. Uh, her talk today is called Revolutionary Declarations and the Status of Human Rights. So please welcome Peg Berman. Thank you, Roger, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Annette and Marie Louise, for organizing this wonderful event for us. Uh, as Roger noted, uh, my title is Revolutionary Declarations and the Status of Human Rights. I'm actually continuing the com uh, some of the reflections that I uh, began in that uh, book on Hannah Arendt and human rights, although as you'll see, I'm a little bit more critical of Hannah Arendt uh, in this paper. Um, and I, I wrote the paper uh, with the question of our conference in mind, what is politics? And I thought that uh, this question could be fleshed out at least in one direction by examining Arendt's discussion of the American and French revolutions and her understanding of the role human rights played in each of them. Now, I, I, because of time, I just want us to say something very briefly about the background of these of remarks, and that is that I'm not unaware of uh, Marx's critique of uh, human rights uh, in, on the Jewish question as a guise for uh, the liberal bourgeois capitalist. Uh, nor am I unaware, and in fact, I'm actually quite sympathetic to the critique of human rights, and I think uh, it was just mentioned by Anson, uh, uh, Sam Moyne, uh, that where human rights today have, have devolved into, in, in many cases, a notion of humanitarian rights. Uh, we see that, for instance, in the rhetoric around the invasion of Iraq, the U.S. invasion of Iraq, where human, the, the discourse of human rights is uh, uh, it, it made in the, in the guise of protecting the victim. And I think that there's, uh, the, the U.N. Uh, now has a, a, a document on the right to protect, the right to intervene, uh, that takes up this notion of humanitarian rights. Um, and again, I think uh, critiques such as Wendy Brown, who argue that this transformation of human rights into human humanitarian rights is really the guise for continued state hegemonic power. Um, and where I disagree with someone like Wendy Brown uh, is that while we can critique the transformation of human rights uh, into humanitarian rights, it seems to me that what, what Brown misses is actually, and that's what I want to flesh out in this paper, is that actually, and I think Marx misses this as well, is that the, the, the modern declaration of right is made in and through revolutionary declarations. And so I'm going to place Hannah Arendt then and her work in Unrevolution in this, in this discussion. While Arendt's discussion of the perplexities of human rights, especially her notion of the right to have rights in the origins of totalitarianism, and Roger just mentioned that, is well known and has garnered a great deal of discussion among her readers, 
there has been surprisingly little discussion of Arendt's fleshing out of this right a decade later in On Revolution. In this later text, Arendt is clear. The right to have rights is the fundamental right all human beings have to, and I quote, live under constitutional limited government. Going further, she claims that the Declaration of Right in its American version, and I quote again, actually pr proclaims no more than the, necess the necessity of civilized government for all mankind, end of quote. With this claim, Arendt suggests that the American Revolution declared at least implicitly the right to have rights, at least in her understanding of the term. The right to have rights is the universal right to membership in a politically organized society in which the citizen is understood as a member of a collective project of governing itself under the rule of law. Speaking of the difference between the American and French Revolution, she writes, and I quote, the American version actually proclaims no more than the necessity of civilized government for all mankind. The French version, however, proclaims the existence of rights independent of and outside the body politic, and then goes on to equate those, these so-called rights, namely the rights of man, with the rights of citizens." End of quote. Going further, Arendt is clear that any revolution whose aim is the establishment of human rights is misguided. She continues, we need only to ward off from our considerations the fateful misunderstanding suggested by the course of the French Revolution that the proclamation of human rights or the guarantee of civil rights could possibly become the aim or content of revolution, end of quote. Instead, Arendt argues that the proper aim of a revolution, an aim that she sees an animating the American Revolution, an aim with which she is entirely sympathetic, is to establish a new system of power. Power not right, she suggests, is the proper aim of the revolution. Speaking of the American Revolution, she states, and I quote, when they declared their independence from this government, the main question for them certainly was not how to limit power, but how to establish it. Not how to limit government, but how to found a new one. And she continues, the establishment of new power could not be based upon what has always essentially been a negative on power, that is, the Bill of Rights. For Arendt, the greatest American innovation in politics, her words, was to establish a system of shared power in which the central government's power could be increased without fear of tyranny, precisely because it was checked by the powers of the state. As she puts it, and I quote, clearly the true objection, excuse me, clearly the true objective of the American Constitution was not to limit power, but to create more power. Actually, to establish and duly constitute an entirely new power center, destined to compensate the Confederate Re Republic, whose authority was to be exerted over a large expanding territory for the power lost through the separation of the colonies from the English crown. Again, for Arendt, the great innovation of American politics lay in its replacing a notion of absolute sovereign power with a conception of power that was multiple and divided. In other words, the problem, according to Hannah Arendt, for the American Revolution was not the problem of human rights, but the problem of reconstituting power. For her, the American Revolution was successful at the very point where the French Revolution failed. While the French Revolution found its, itself in the vicious circle, her words, of the pouvoir constituent and the pouvoir constitu between the constituting power and the constituted power, which led to the authority of the, uh, the problem of the authority of constituted power, namely, who were the people authorized to constitute power? By what authority 
what constituted power legitimate. The, she, her argument here is that this is that the French uh, became caught in this vicious circle uh, concerning the, pow uh, the legitimacy and the authority of constituted power. Now she wants, she makes the claim that in the American Revolution, and again I quote, they had the great good fortune that the people of the colonies prior to their conflict with England were organized in self-governing bodies such that there never was any serious questioning of the pouvoir constituent of those who framed the state constitutions and eventually the Constitution of the United States. In other words, the people already knew who they were, they were already authorized to constitute power and their constituting power gave the, 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 uh, uh, the constituted power, the government, its authority. Now in her reading, I want just to note that the American people are not in question. Those authorized to constitute power were those who were already in self-governing bodies. She gives the example of the Mayflower Compact. It's a real favorite of hers. And these bodies, she argues, were constituted through mutual promising. As Arendt puts it in, self, in Civil Disobedience, and I quote, this is the only form of government in which people are bound together not through historical memories, or ethnic homogeneity as in the nation state, and not through Hobbes' Leviathan, which overalls them all and thus unites them, but through the strength of mutual promises. Thus she argues the American public, the American Republic rests on the power of the people. The old Roman potestas in populo insofar as constituted power receives its authority through this prior mutual activity of promising, which means that the authority of the constituted power of government and its laws rests on the active consent of the people. I'm going to return to this momentarily. For Arendt, therefore, the right to have rights is the universal right to belong to an organized government in which human rights are equivalent to the legal rights of citizens. Indeed, as Arendt approvingly points out, this is the function of the Bill of Rights in the U.S. Constitution. The Bill of Rights amended to the U.S. Constitution stipulates the rights of the U.S. citizenry. These are not universal rights. Human rights, therefore, and again Arendt approves, are reduced to rights granted by positive law. What is universal about human rights is simply the declaration that all human beings have the right to live under organized and positive law. Again, for a rent of unrevolution, the universality of the right to have rights is limited to the universal right to membership in an organized state, a constituted power. Thus, the aim of the revolution ought to be the reconstitution of state power and not human rights per se. At the same time, and this returns me to Arendt's initial discussion of the right to have rights in Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt herself does not simply understand the right to have rights in terms of political belongingness or political membership. She also understands the right to have rights as the right to significant speech and action. And this is a passage where she first introduces uh, the right to have rights. She states, we become aware of the existence of a right to have <coughs> rights. And this means to live in a framework where one is judged by one's actions and opinions, as well as the right to belong to some kind of organized community only when millions of people emerged who had lost and could not regain these rights because of the new global political situation. She points out in the same passage that certainly there are those among us who speak and act, but she points out that to speak without being listened to and to act without anyone paying attention or for it to have no import is to be reduced at best to the role of the fool and at worst to a kind of living death. This is her point in the human condition when she argues that a life lived without speech and action 
is a life that is, her words, literally dead to the world. Thus, by significant speech and action, she understands pe speech and action that has publicity, significant publicity, which is on her own account, or which can on her own account, only be gained in acting in concert with others. And of course, this is her definition of power. Hence, for her, power and action are synonymous terms. Thus, it seems to me, when Arendt argues that the proper aim of revolution is power, she means that revolutions are for the sake of speaking and acting in concert with others. This is her definition of power, and I quote, power comes into being only if and when men join themselves together for the purpose of action. And it will disappear when, for whatever reason, they disperse and desert one another." End of quote. Power, therefore, denotes not only the ability to act, but action in concert with others. Thus, Arendt insists that, and I quote again, the power structure itself precedes and outlasts all aims, so that power, far from being the means to an end, is actually the very condition of enabling a group of people to think and act in the means ends category. End of quote. If we return then for a moment to Arendt's claim that the proper aim of a revolution is power, not right, we can see that things are more complicated than Arendt seems to make them in On Revolution, and they're complicated by her own analysis of the right to have rights in the earlier text, of the, the Origins. The right to have rights, as she articulates it in the Origins, includes both the right to belong to a political community and the right to significant speech and action, the latter her definition of power. In other words, her initial notion of the right to have rights makes no distinction between power and right. The right to have rights is the right to power, understood as the right to significant speech and action, a right that can only be exercised when acting in concert with others for the sake of beginning something new, the last Arendt's understanding in freedom of freedom. In other words, Arendt's account of the rights to have right, the right to have rights, at least in its first and most robust version, with its emphasis on significant speech and action, declares the right, the universal right, to political agency as well as the right to political membership. And with this, I want to turn to the French Revolution and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen asking the question whether Hannah Arendt too quickly dismissed the very aspect of the right to have rights that she herself points to when first articulating this universal right. And my claim here is, the question really is, in her reading of the French Revolution, does she, in her dismissal of the French Revolution, or at least her, her critique, does she too quickly, or does she fail to see that actually uh, the French Revolution gives her uh, the, the, uh, the, the example of that, that first right, the right to significant speech and action that she herself has articulated in the origins of totalitarianism. Now to begin to answer this question, it's important to just step back from Hannah Arendt for a moment and recall that while the US Declaration of Independence <coughs> opens with the Declaration of the Universal Unalienable Rights of Life, Liberty, and Happiness, it quickly moves, I think this is what Arendt sees, to the rights of the good people of the 13 colonies who, quote, through their representatives, and again, quote, in the name of the one people, the good people of these colonies, end of quote, proclaim their independence to form a new state named explicitly, quote, the United States of America. Important here is that, that this declaration is made in the name of the one people, the good people of these uh, colonies. Only those who are part of the people, the good people of the colonies, 
have the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As Arendt notes, the Bill of Rights attached to the U.S. Constitution stipula stipulates that these are political rights belonging only to those recognized as citizens in the United States. In other words, as we've seen above, in the U.S. Declaration, human rights are from the inception inscribed in institutions, the assembly, the law, and these good people who are recognized by these institutions and these laws. By contrast, while the 1789 and especially the 1793 Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen opens in the name of the French people, it immediately moves to the general claim that the miseries of the world result from the forgetfulness of rights. Thus, the Declaration, the French Declaration, goes on to state, quote, this declaration being ever present to all members of the social body may unceasingly remind of their, be reminded of their rights and duties, and the social body, I submit, to which the Declaration addresses itself must be understood as extending to more than simply the French people. The social body is any body that must be reminded unceasingly of its rights and obligations in order to prevent the miseries of the world that ensue when these rights and obligations are forgotten. Of importance is that the French Declaration is not made in the name of a representative who acts in the name of the one people as does its American counterpart. The people are not named nor are they represented. Who is declared and who declares is left indeterminate. No signatures accompany the document. Unlike the US Declaration, dominated as it is by a long list of specific complaints against the British Crown, including the British tendency to hold meetings in the far in far flung places, making the signatories appear closer to university professors complaining of an inconvenient conference location rather than radical revolutionaries, the French Declaration leaves unspecified the miseries that occur when the rights of man are forgotten. It does, however, list 35 rights of man and the citizen, ending, and here I'm relying on the 1793 version, with the fundamental right, and I quote, the consequence of the other rights of man the right to resist oppression. And here's the quote. There is oppression against the social body when a single one of its members is oppressed. There is oppression against each member when the social body is oppressed. And the quote, and it concludes again, I quote, when the government violates the rights of the people, insurrection is for the people and for each portion of the people the most sacred of rights and the most indispensable of duties. And here again, the people are not named. Moreover, this fundamental right to insurrection, the consequences of all the other rights, cannot be guaranteed by the government and certainly cannot be inscribed in a Bill of Rights. Instead, the right to resist is a right that can only be undertaken by the oppressed themselves. As Claude Lafour points out, the right to resist is located in the citizenry, not in the state, and I quote Lafour, who the citizens are at this moment of resisting oppression is uncertain, and the tribunal before which the right to resist is asserted is not visible, end of quote. Thus, contrary to Arendt's analysis and on revolution, my argument here is that the French Declaration does not declare the sovereign will of the people because the identity of the people is entirely undetermined. Instead, as Lafour puts it, the declaration, and I quote Lafour, implies an unprecedented historical adventure whose causes and effects cannot be localized within the sphere that is conventionally defined of as that of government. These rights are not inscribed initially in political institutions, nor are they held in common by those recognized by these institutions. Again, the difference with the U.S. Declaration of Independence is noteworthy. The 1776 Declaration produces citizens of a new constituted state, 
a state founded in the name of a specific people, those of the good people of the 13 colonies, who are represented by the signatories that bring the new state, the United States of America, into being. And it's clear that the aim is the protection and security of its citizens. The 1789 and the 1793 declarations do not produce a new state, but instead, I submit, new political subjects. It concludes with the right to revolt against oppression, and it does not specify the form this revolt will take. The French Declaration of Human Rights is, is not done in the name of the suffering of the other, as a rent asserts in On Revolution, but in the recognition of the oppression in wrong do and wrong done to those who have a right and a du duty to rebel. And in declaring the right to resist the declaration, the French declaration produces political agency where it did not exist before. To put it in Arendtian terms, the aim of the French Revolution was the right to power, understood as the capacity for significant speech and acting in concert with others for the sake of beginning something new politically. More succinctly, in the French version, the Declaration of Right is the Declaration of Power. Returning to Arendt, and this is a criticism, it is surprising that when she concludes on revolution, deploring the fact of the lost treasure of revolutionary politics, finding it erupting briefly in the Soviet Workers' Council and the Hungarian Revolution, she does not consider that, that the reason the French had a more difficult time in framing a constitution was due to that aspect of the political that she herself most desired, namely what Rosa Luxemburg calls a permanent revolution and what she herself named the possibility of the new. Strangely, her critique of pity, which we could read as an early critique of humanitarian rights, and I think in that way that critique of pity is very much uh, important for the discussion of human rights today, as I said in, my, in the beginning of my remarks, in what I see is a, a, a very negative transformation of human rights into humanitarian rights. Um, but again, strangely, her critique of pity, seemingly at work in the French Revolution, blinded her to the ways in which the Declaration of, Ma of the Right of Man and the Citizen produced political agents capable of demanding their emancipation, viewing their emancipation as the universal criteria of general emancipation from oppression, including social oppression. And this is all the more puzzling when we consider that she ends her analysis of the Dreyfus Affair in Origins of Totalitarianism by emphasizing her admiration for Clemenceau, for whom the political struggle was, and I quote, in actual terms, the oppressed fighting their oppressors. And finally, it is puzzling, given her critique of the seemingly inseparable reduction of human rights to the rights of citizens, that Arendt did not grasp that the US Declaration paid a high price for its political stability and ease of constitution making by again reducing human rights to the rights of the citizens guaranteed by the state wherein rights take the form of a Bill of Rights, a price she herself was certainly aware of as a refugee from a state for whom rights were nothing but state rights, which could be revoked at any time from anyone who was declared to be alien to that state. And finally, briefly, the Declaration of Right as the declaration both of resistance and simultaneously the formation of new political agents is the unacknowledged moment in Arendt's reading of the spirit of American laws as mutual promising, or what she also calls consent, which I, I spoke briefly about uh, earlier. Consent, she argues, implies dissent. Indeed, this is the center of her remarks on civil disobedience. Those who give their consent to the law also have the obligation to withdraw it, to dissent. This is certainly at work in her critique of Eichmann, uh, which Roger mentioned earlier uh, uh, was, was written in the same year uh, uh, as On Revolution. Uh, her critique of Eichmann uh, is that he forgets that politics is not the nursery. 
We do not obey the laws like we obey our parents. We give our support to the laws and we must withdraw that support when circumstances warrant. To my mind, Arendt focuses too much on the mutual alliances and promises established prior to the revolution, missing entirely the fact that it was the moment of the revolution itself, the declaration of independence, the active dissent that was the condition of possibility of, for the consent among the citizens to pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to the revolution. While there may have been mutual compacts and alliances prior to the Declaration of Independence, it was only in the moment of revolution, a moment of dissent, that a new constitution of power to which the citizenry gave its consent was possible. Thus, I submit dissent and not consent is the spirit of the laws that authorizes acts of civil disobedience. In conclusion, while it is my argument that Arendt does not grasp that both revolutionary declarations made in the name of, of universal rights are made with the aim of power, nevertheless, her insight that the declaration of rights is effective only if they are institutionally inscribed ought not to be lost for those of us thinking politics today. Here I think Arendt's great debt to Montesquieu's insights that every form of government is animated by a principle or what he calls the spirit of the laws could be supplemented. Recall that for Montesquieu, the three forms of government, monarchy, republican, and tyranny, are animated by three political affections, distinction, virtue, and fear. Distinction, the love of distinction, the monarchy, virtue is the love uh, uh, that animates the republic, and fear, of course, uh, is the affection uh, in tyranny. It seems to me that what occurs with both the American and French Declaration of Right, a declaration, as I've tried to show, that is inseparable from a de declaration of revolution, a declaration of resistance, is that a new form of power is inaugurated, which I will simply call here, for lack of time, radical democracy whose animating principle, the spirit of its laws, is active dissent, such that the form of power in radical de democracies is always subject to questioning, and as such, new political agents are always possible. In conclusion, then, I want to look at an example for how we might think this form of radical democracy and its principle of active dissent. Here I want to look briefly at Arendt's passing remarks on the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights made toward the end of origins. Suggesting that the 1948 declaration, and I quote, showed an uncanny similarity in language and composition to that of societies for the prevention of cruelty to animals, she goes on to say, more significantly to my mind, neither before or after the Second World War have the victims themselves ever invoked these fundamental rights, which were so evidently denied them in their many attempts to find a way out of the barbed-wired labyrinth into which events had driven them. On the contrary, the victims shared the disdain and indifference of the powers that be for any attempt of the marginal societies to enforce human rights in any elementary or general sense." End of quote. Arendt reveals here her ambivalence towards political agency. On the one hand, she critiques victims for not attempting to persuade their governments to enforce human rights. And on the other hand, she suggests that this enforcement will occur only if victims invoke their fundamental rights by becoming politically active in order to find a way out of their barbed wire labyrinth. In other words, Arendt suggests in the above passage that the way out of the labyrinth of violence is through political agency in the name of human rights, a suggestion that seems to have been lost in her later analysis of revolutionary action. I want to suggest that while Arendt might have been without example, this is not our case today. An example of those who exercise their right to political agency 
that is the right to resist oppression, which informed or animated the reconstitution of political institutions, occurred in 1992 when Bosnian women claimed their right to resist oppression in one of its most atrocious and barbaric forms, namely genocidal rape. In claiming their right to resist oppression, a new right, namely the right to sexual self-determination, emerged. Indeed, their appearance before the ICTY, the International uh, uh, Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, belies Arendt's claim in the origins of totalitarianism, in which she argues that no victims had insisted on the enforcement of their fundamental rights. The women who testified before the ICTY did exactly what Arendt claimed no victims had done. Rather than disdain and indifference, they took seriously the 1948 Declaration of Universal Human Rights, which gave them the right to appear before an international tribunal and to make a claim of human rights violation. In other words, in claiming human rights, as I just said, they created a, right, a new right of sexual self-determination. And through that, and this is my, I, uh, I submit, that the, through their claim of human rights made to this international tribunal, they created a new transnational political agent. In so doing, they moved the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights closer to the 1789-1793 Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen namely a declaration of political agency, a declaration of political power by those who until that moment had none. By testifying before the ICTY, the Muslim women exercised their right to have rights, their right to bear witness to their oppression, and in doing so, claim their right to sexual self-determination. At the same time, and this seems to me one of the problems for politics today, or thinking po the political today, and this returns us to Arendt's point regarding human rights. The, we must also note that the effectiveness of the Bosnian women's claim of right was due, at least in part, to their claim being made before a public authority, namely the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. While the inaugural claim of right and protest against oppression by these women was made on the street and in the press, these venues were not enough. Only with the institutional establishment of the ICTY did the Bosnian women gain the right to sexual self-determination. We must recall that the ICTY recognized the relationship between rape and genocide, but went further, convicting the three Bosnian Serb soldiers who came before the tribunal, not only of war crimes, but crimes against humanity. And with this, a new universal right emerged from the tribunal's decision. And this is Arendt's point that ought not to be lost, even in my, my critique. To be effective, human rights must be inscribed in legal orders recognized by public authorities and institutions. Still further, without the legal inscription of rights, the declaration of right remains at best an aspiration and at worst a political fiction. In still other words, without the state of right, the right of resistance is impotent. But to agree entirely with Arendt's view is to forget that the international legal right of sexual self-determination first emerged out of the truly revolutionary and extra-legal acts of the Bosnian women who testified before the ICTY and in testifying gave right, rise to it the new right. It was their active declaration of the principle of right the right to resist oppression that first led to the United Nations establishing the ICTY. Certainly without the ICTY, no legal right would exist. Hence it appears that human rights, and I think this is the task of radical de democracy, requires both the revolutionary declaration of the right to resist oppression in all its forms, whether social, cultural, political, or sexual, and it requires political authorities and tribunals that confer the state of right upon these claims. Contra Arendt, then, the declaration of rights must be the aim of the revolution, insofar as this aim is synonymous with and inseparable with 
or inseparable from the creation of power. That is, the creation of political agency and the possibility of new political beginnings and new forms of political belongingness. Thank you.